Hello everyone, welcome to episode 6 of Game of Power. Man, 6 episodes in, I'm super excited for this episode. We're gonna start with Terrell. Terrell is the executive producer, creator, and director of Webster Hall TV show. So I'm super interested to see kind of what the process is of making a TV show and putting that out. And so definitely excited to tap in with him. Uh, our second guest is going to be Noah Fennell. Noah is the CEO of Data Earn. Data Earn is a startup out here in New York, in New York City, um, and they work on data. So super excited to talk to both of them. Um, and yeah, let's just kind of get into it. I'm going to invite to today. So finally have this banner up. Um, like a look a little bookshelf so you know i'm trying to set up the vibe you know i had a yo hello can you hear me yeah 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 what's going on bro how you doing i'm good how are you just going for a walk i'm good i'm good thank you thank you so much for coming on the show man i i've been tapped into you know your clips for a while i've seen the page and i just i'm really interested i, I want to learn a lot more about what it takes to to put out a tv show i want to you know just pick your brain a little bit and see how, how you came up with everything so thank you for coming on the show yeah um so like what do you want to know just like the yeah process. for sure for sure for sure so i guess my yeah. first question is you're you're a year behind me in nyu correct like you're you're about to be a junior next year um, no, I'm actually graduating in the fall. Oh, you're graduating. Okay, okay, got you, got you. Yeah, yeah. So tell me this, what, when did the idea of Webster Hall come to you? Uh, what got you kind of into this? Yeah, so, um, sorry, there's like a car. Hold on, I'm letting the car pass. Um, but yeah, so I actually started Webster Hall like about a year ago. Um, I was actually pre-med, uh, like during COVID, and then I kind of like had a transition in like life goals. And I was like, okay, I don't really want to do this anymore. Um, I like writing, uh, and I just, I don't know, I like to tell stories. So I took a producing class over the summer, like about a year ago. It would be probably finishing up right now. Um, and I came up with the concept for Webster Hall in that class, and my professor really liked the idea. And we got to, like, pitch, like, make a lookbook and, like, a pitch deck, and we got to, like, pitch it in front of the class, and, like, the students were really receptive of it. So for the most part, like, that's kind of how I came up with the idea. So it was about a year ago this idea even came about. Wow. That's incredible. So you, you started in from and you went, you went and now you're doing, you know, directing, writing. What was that transition like? Like, how was it making that final decision to be like, you know, I'm going to go follow this and change up the whole trajectory of everything I've been doing? Uh, it was kind of scary at first. Um, I think taking classes really helped boost my confidence, like taking a bunch of like producing classes. And then once I got an internship um, with like a talent agency, that's when I was like, okay, like I actually have potential with this because uh, I'd get to meet with writers, directors, producers every single week and they'd kind of like talk to me about their scripts and I'd read scripts before they'd be like released and stuff like that. So it kind of really like solidified, I guess, my belonging. That's what I fire. That's what I fire. So tell me this, when you have the idea for the show, you said you came up with the pitch deck, you pitched it in front of the class. What's next? What comes next in the process? How do you, how did you get the show kind of up and running? Yeah, so um, I did a casting call um, through the Talent Guild, and that kind of helped me get a lot of actors interested. Um, and then a bunch of people, once they saw that actors were interested, a bunch of my friends were like, oh, we want to help, we want to help. So at first, this, I wanted this to be like a small, like cute little thing. Like I just posted like a, like would just post like a few videos on my page, but a lot of people like just kept joining and it kind of like snowballed and it kind of got bigger than like what I, what I honestly thought it was going to be. So now it's kind of like a full on, like web series and stuff like that. So that's kind of just how it happened. Like I was not expecting it uh, at all to be like as big as it kind of is and it's still kind of growing, so. Wow, yeah. that's, that's not cool. That's not interesting to hear actually. So kind of tell me a little bit about the show. Uh, what is Webster Hall and like what, yeah, like what, what, what should we expect? Yeah, so it's about the black experience at a PWI. So I actually transferred to NYU um, from a different school, from a state school in Massachusetts. And coming here was like a culture shock for me, just culturally, because like, even though I did grow up with a lot of white students or, or yeah, white classmates, it was still kind of like different. So I guess like, it kind of just shows like, I guess like the culture shock that comes for like different black students at a PWI, like just because a student is black doesn't mean you may relate to them. Like they may have a different perspective or come from different walks of life versus like where I went to high school, which is behind me. Uh, like we're all kind of similar in like the way that we 
we sing. So it kind of just like opened up my perspective on like, I guess like the diaspora and how we are for the most part. Okay. Tell me this, how much have you learned about the college experience and like the different things that black people face in PWIs ever since you started making the show? Like what is your, what was your perception of everything before you started it? And like now that you like had to like, you know, shoot scenes and, and kind of craft this whole story? Yeah, um, I guess I learned more about like socioeconomic differences and how they kind of can determine or predetermine like friend groups and stuff like that. Um, I guess that's like the biggest thing. I guess like the socioeconomic difference and also I guess like the lack of representation even still like even if a story is still black there may not always be like you know like representation of like women with darker skin tones or like people in the LGBT community. So that's kind of what I was learning and as I get a lot of criticism um, I'd be like, okay, like, I understand exactly what you're saying. So I guess, like, it kind of taught me to be more open-minded of, like, the communities within our community that sometimes we neglect. Yeah, no, most definitely. I can I can definitely understand that, especially going to NYU with, like, the Black students here are coming from a lot of different places as well. So it's it's definitely kind of, I'm, I'm interested to see your spin on it. So tell me this, how, does, how do you go about making a show? Do you, like, do you write the script first? And then, like, go from, so, like, what, like, how does that kind of work? Like, is everything scripted? Is everything kind of go with the flow when you start shooting? Like, how does that work? Um, so, you, it depends on the person. Like, if you're, like, more of a visual person. Um, but I like to make, like, a lookbook. So, in class, like, our final project was actually, like, a lookbook or, like, a pitch deck where we, like, put, like, all the characters, like, a log line, which is, like, a basic, like, one-sentence descriptor of, like, what the series is about and, like, episode descriptions um so we start with like a lookbook and then after that we could find like a writer but I like to write too um and find a writer to like write a script uh based off of like the lookbook and then we'd look back revise together and stuff like that and then that's kind of how you start like you get the script developed and then after that you kind of send the script out to different like DPs or producers and be like hey do you want to help me get a crew together so that's kind of like the process of that okay Okay, and then so how, like, where have you guys been, where are you right now in the process when it comes to everything? Yeah, so we've shot a bunch of uh, different scenes, which we're going to release as, like, a web series. Um, I plan on, like, shooting more scenes during the semester and going more into the arcs of, like, the main cast that we have, while, as well as, like, exploring, like, different things, because, like, you know, different topics become trending, and, like, you know, we kind of want to be more hip to everything that's new, so... I guess we're going to just keep shooting more stuff. Okay. So it seems like you're you're kind of releasing it in a very agile way where you get to kind of put out different bites, different scenes. You get to kind of craft different stories within this whole ecosystem. Is that kind of the goal of this instead of having something more like Netflix where it's like these are the 10 episodes and like this is what you're going to get? Is it something more dynamic with shorter but more well-crafted stories within that? Yeah, I wanted more of, like, an ensemble cast. Like, I didn't want, like, a specific main character, but I'd want, like, the main cast to all be main characters and kind of explore their arc differently. Wow. That's really cool. That's really cool. I haven't seen anything like that. So that's, that's, that's my part. Tell me this. What is the hardest part about putting together uh, a TV show like this? Um, I guess, like, working with different personalities and, like, kind of just, like, yeah, just kind of figuring out different types of people's personalities and kind of like how to work with them. Like if you want to direct or produce, you really have to be like accommodating sometimes, but also have to know when to like put your foot down and like direct. So it's like having a balance between like being assertive while at the same time understanding people do things differently. Okay. So you're, yeah. so you're the director of the show, correct? Yeah, I'm the director, executive producer. I so help what write, is yeah. What is what does a director do for for a show? I'm not too like I don't I don't know too much of the difference between like a director and a producer and like kind of explain those roles a little bit. I'm just a little curious. Um, so the director mostly, I mean, they could work with like the actors and kind of help the actors kind of like tell the story visually. They also kind of like work with the rest of the crew and kind of direct the crew on like, okay, this is what we need for this, like mostly post-production and during production. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, the director, a lot of times they just work with the actors, uh, kind of help them, you know, describe who the character is and properly display the character on screen and then work in post-production to like help with editing and stuff like that as well. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. For for me, like even when it comes down to this show, you know, I realize like you know the creative part, like the shooting and stuff, that comes pretty easily. You normally kind of know what you want when it comes to that, but even like the the hardest part really and the most time consuming part is the post production it's that it's the editing and it's kind of crafting that from there how do you like approach that um how do you approach like the editing and the the post product aspect of kind of crafting this whole story together yeah so so i actually went to the black film festival in miami a couple of weeks ago and and one thing that i think it was robin feedy uh she's a a producer one thing she said is like most projects fail especially black projects fail in post production um, so, and, and in post-production, it's mostly with color grading and, like, editing. Um, so from that, I kind of took away that, like, you kind of needed to be in consistent contact with your editor uh, and kind of, like, you know, just get the feedback rolling. Like, when they send you a draft, give feedback ASAP and, you know, they can make a new draft. Sometimes it's even good to, like, sit down with the editor and, like, watch as they edit. Uh, but most of it is, like, just checking in with people because you may not always be face to face with the post-production team you just kind of have to like check in with them and like remind them like hey uh like what you know deadlines too okay yeah yeah, that makes sense that makes sense because that's really that's where the meat of of everything everything is going okay tell me this what do you think you've learned along this this entire process about you know crafting together a story from idea uh to script and pitch decks to putting it out and and distributing it what have you what have you learned most along this process um i guess to like trust your team uh like work with people but like don't micromanage your team like they know what they're doing and sometimes when you like let them do their thing like you get like a perfect thing versus when you try to micromanage people so i guess it's like basically like just working with people trusting your team trusting your actors and you know, just trusting the vision will come through. That's completely, like, that's so correlating to everything that I do. Like, when it comes down to, like, running a startup and stuff like that, it's like you have these people in these different positions for a reason. And so if you try to micromanage them or if you don't let them, you know, use their talents and use play into their strengths the way that, that they should, then you're you're kind of holding yourself back. You're holding the whole project back. So I think that's very interesting coming from you who – someone who kind of crafted this story but then at the same time is like you know i'm gonna give people their leeway to kind of play into their strengths it's not interesting yeah yeah thank you tell me this so what what what's next like what 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 should we be expecting i guess my last question is what's next what uh what do you have on your mind what are you working on now um anything you kind of want to talk about yeah so i'm just gonna keep releasing scenes uh i learned marketing is very important so i'm meeting with like marketing team and we're like releasing scenes consistently with the theme so i'm gonna keep releasing stuff for this um i'm eventually gonna pitch this out to different networks like hbo and stuff like that uh, and then also working on another project with a few students at nyu that i can't really reveal right now but eventually we'll be able to re- reveal but it's like a short little series like this and i'm gonna be actually acting for the first or not the first okay. time but like you know acting that's fire, man. That's fire. Wait, well, before you go, I, I'm curious. So you talked about a little bit about distribution. What are you, what's your mindset around that? Like where, where are people going to be able to watch the show? Like what different platforms or how are you thinking about putting out when in, ter- in terms of that? Yeah. So I guess for now it's going to be like Instagram, YouTube and, and Vimeo. Um, and I think Instagram is going to be like the main platform just because that's where most of us have like the largest following. Okay. Okay, man. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I really, I really appreciate you. And, and man, I'm, I'm so excited to, to watch the show. I, I love, you know, the clip that you just put out recently. So, you know, I feel like you're doing a good job of telling the story that a lot of us go to uh, at a school like NYU. So, no, I really appreciate you. Thank you for coming yeah. on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. And it was great coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you, man. Have a good one. All right. You too. Bye-bye. See you later. Wow, I'm so I'm so interested to to watch Webster Hall. Like I I think you know projects like that in this uh, in New York and like even projects out of NYU about college is is super interesting. I think it's a very unique story that I'm I'm so excited to just watch and see how he gets to tell it. Next, we're gonna have on Noah Fan. Yeah, let me send him an invite. Hi, mom. <laughs> Yo. Hey, how's it going? What's going on, man? How you doing? Doing good. Doing good. It's been a busy day, but it's been good. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. You're actually uh, the first other startup founder that's been on the show. So I definitely wanted to use this time wisely and just kind of pick your brain a little bit and, uh, you know, to see where, see where, we, see where, see where this takes us. So, excited yeah, no, to be I'm, on. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. So tell me this. What, like, w tell me about the idea of Data Earn. Where did you come up with that idea? Uh, what made you start pursuing that? Like, where did this all start? Um, yeah, uh, well, it started a couple years ago. Um, I was working at a blockchain identity startup, uh, and I was dealt with a lot of, you know, the data privacy laws that, you know, were going on uh, during that time. And at the startup, they had this problem of they didn't know how to, you know, uh, allow data to be moved across different ecosystems uh, within, you know, global data privacy laws. Um, so I kind of got, you know, a really good in-depth, uh, you know, perspective at a young age to, you know, get experience kind of in that industry. Uh, and then I also worked at kind of a marketing startup, um, not a startup, but like a full-on fledged company. <laughs> and they were selling, you know, information for stocks and bonds uh, in terms of subscriptions. And um, I got a really good uh, look at, you know, how they take data and they use that data to, you know, upsell or downsell, you know, people coming onto their website. Um, so I kind of saw, you know, how these laws can kind of protect the users and also how companies are using this data to actually go out and, you know, market towards these people. Um, so I would kind of went on this journey uh, down this rabbit hole, of, you know, how can I get my data? Uh, you know, where is it? Uh, and, you know, how to, you know, find out where it is and be able to, uh, you know, uh, what else? <laughs> find out, you know, where it is and then, you know, be able to say, hey, how can I reclaim ownership of this? Um, and, you know, that journey has kind of taken me down this, down this path for the last, you know, two, three years. Yeah, man, that's, that's super interesting. And I feel like data is something that we always hear about. Uh, you hear it in the news when, you know, uh, Apple blocks Facebook from doing certain things. Um, you kind of just hear the word data a lot, but like, kind of talk about that. What's the misconception about data? Uh, what's the thing that you're focused on when it comes to data? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think everyone knows, you know, like, every, like the apps that you're on every day are kind of tracking all the information. Uh, but I think, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is that they can access that data. Um, so that's kind of what our platform, you know, utilizes and allows people to do is, you know, an easy way to actually access the data and view it. Um, you know, every day you're on a, an app like Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat and their algorithms, you know, trying to make you think in a certain way. Uh, but you've never been able to actually, you know, see the information that they're using to do that. Uh, so that's kind of what our platform uh, provides currently is just being able to actually go out and see that information and see, you know, how these algorithms are working against us and for us. Wow, that's super interesting. And so what your company does is it allows you to access that data and then obviously monetize that data on top of that instead of having companies like Instagram monetize the data? Yeah, so the first uh, you know, version of the platform was launched. We launched it on uh, May 10th. Uh, but just being able to access and understand it is kind of the first leg that we built out. Um, and then hopefully in the next you know, upcoming years, you know, we're going to actually build out this marketplace that people can actually go out and sell it. Um, but, you know, hopefully in like a year, uh, we can have that, you know, up and running. Uh, but currently, right now, we're just expanding, um, just adding companies to our platform and being able to allow people to access and just understand the information. That's fire, bro. That's fire. So I'm, I'm super interested in this product that you've built. And so I kind of want to ask you, what is the process like and, and how did you go about taking, you know, that idea of I want to be in the data space to actually, you know, a, two two three years later having having a product what goes in the middle of that how do you how do you go about building a product yeah i mean a lot of a lot of work <laughs> goes into it uh but i think you know the best way to take like an idea to you know an actual like company or product is actually uh just sketching out everything you know designing it first you know how is this going to work um so like i'm a big advocate of using figma but i kind of sketched everything out and said you know this is kind of how the platform is going to work um, this is, you know, kind of the proof of concept, you know, can we actually build this? Does it make sense? Like, is the UI UX, you know, good enough for, you know, an average user to use? Um, and then once you kind of have sketched out, then it's going into the nitty gritty of, you know, the technicals and actually figuring out you know, how to code it and build it, uh, which I think, you know, has taken <laughs> the longest part uh, is because I didn't really know how to code. Um, and then kind of COVID being home uh, alone and just, you know, got a quarantine. Um, and, you know, being able to, to, you know, really go in the nitty gritty of the technicals and understand it and really just, you know, kind of stick with it and be consistent. Um, but, you know, two years later, you know, it allowed me to, you know, put it out and, and launch it. That's mad interesting. That's mad interesting. 
I think that one of the best parts about what you've done is you had the idea and you said you couldn't code. And you basically went through the whole process of learning how to code. But at the same time, you had something that you wanted to code already. You already had a product. Uh, you, began, you began with the end in mind, in a way. What, would you, what advice would you have to, to founders that are not technical, that want to start tech companies? Uh, even like myself, you know, yeah. kind of getting into coding as well. Yeah, uh, definitely find people that know how to code. Um, so, like, obviously, like, I couldn't do this by myself. I was surrounded, you know, with my by my brother, by uh, there's Otis, there's Alex, there's Angelo, there's a uh, there's a guy named Stu, there's another guy named Forrest. But you know, putting yourself around people who are you know much smarter than you, that you can kind of have a backboard to hey, hey, I want to try to build this feature. You know, how can we go about you know doing this? But then what you have to do, kind of as like a founder, is obsess over that idea and you know really figure out you know how you're actually going to build it and try to get it done in you know like a timely manner. Okay. Okay. And so tell me this, uh, I'm very interested in process. A lot of the times I, I love hearing kind of how people prepare for work and like what they do. What is like kind of a, a normal week or day in the life of how you, how you work? Like what, do you, what different things do you try to tackle throughout the day? How do you kind of organize everything and get shit done? Yeah. Uh, that's actually something that I've been you know focusing on a little bit is kind of the organization of it. Um, you know, what I try to do is I try to, you know, answer all my emails in the morning. Uh, and then, you know, I have my calls kind of, sometimes they come, come throughout the day uh, where I can't really choose the exact time, but I try to, you know, put them towards kind of the morning uh, or like mid-afternoon. Um, and then, you know, really for like the actual like building, um, I'll do that in like the later afternoon and I try to really focus on the product. Um, so it's kind of, you know, in the morning, kind of take care of emails, you know, emailing people back and forth. Um, and then, you know, throughout the day is, you know, calls, focusing on product. Um, and then, you know, I'll try to like go work out or, you know, go get dinner, uh, and then kind of come back. And then if there's anything that, you know, throughout the day that I didn't really finish, um, I kind of, you know, in the afternoon, just kind of finish that up. Uh, okay. So, so that's a typical day, but it definitely varies, you know, day by day. So you're, you're, you'd say your role right now is a lot more on product building side. Um, or like, what, what is that kind of like when it comes down to like how you distribute your time through, through the different parts of the business? Yeah, um, well, it kind of depends on what phase we're on. Um, like right before launch, it was really just getting the product, you know, working, right? Uh, but now right, it's, you know, we're focusing on raising. We're focusing on, you know, adding new companies to the platform. Uh, we're focusing on, you know, upgrading our charts uh, and making, you know, kind of a better design. Um, so it kind of just depends. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, try to look into and build and create. Yeah, no, for sure. I think sometimes it is, it is even a little overwhelming. Like I remember a couple of years ago, back when, back in the day when I used to Google, like, what does a CEO do? Or like, you know what I mean? Like what, like what, what am I supposed to do? I think like over the, the last year, I've, I've learned a lot of different things about process and like what we're supposed to do. I think, um, I think selling is something that's very interesting, not in terms of selling something that's very transactional all the time, more so selling a vision to your team selling selling you know your company to investors as well what do you what have you kind of learned about that when it comes down to kind of crafting your vision obviously it's something that it's hard to always explain where you want to go with everybody else but kind of how have you how have you gone about storytelling selling and kind of you know bringing people onto the idea of data yeah i mean i think the idea at its like core is very complex because you're dealing with like global data privacy laws and you're dealing with you know a lot of technical things that people might not try to comprehend or understand but you know just trying to get it down into like the most simple form like where you know a second grader you know or fourth grader could understand it you know that's what we kind of try to do with some of our marketing and the way we kind of you know sell the stories you know we dumb it down so you know anyone can understand it um because when you, if i was like you know do you have to do a you know global you have to do a dc like dsar request and you know uh you have to go through all these laws to get your data people would be like that's way too confusing like i don't want to use that product so we've done things like create like data cards um you know we want to have like a data store um so you know just creating you know simple ways to convey you know complex ideas um is i think you know one thing that we try to do um um at data Earn. That makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Even saying like data store and like data cards, it's like things that we can kind of grab onto and be like, oh, this is like pretty snackable, digestible. It makes a lot of sense. Tell me this, what, what do you think the, the number one role of a CEO in a startup is? I think kind of being like the workforce behind it in a way. Um, like I think you need to be like working on it like all the time. Got to be especially passionate about it. 
but I also think a part of it is like being on top of like, you know, other people and trying to get them to, to do work and motivate them. And I think what you said like previously was, you know, on the guy who's here before with the Webster Hall. Uh, I think it was like a kind of good thing you said with that is, you know, you got to you know, dish out to, you know, to other people, but you also have to, you know, find what their strengths are and how they can actually help you build it. And then kind of empowering them, you know, through those strengths and saying, Hey, you know, you're really good at this you know, this can really help us with our product as well. But if you try to, you know, force someone to do something that's not within, you know, what they're good at, then you're kind of just, you know, not advancing the way you want to. And, you know, the product doesn't get built, you know, with like passion or if it, and, or it doesn't even get built at all because they don't want to yeah. do it. So it's kind of finding like the motivations behind people and, you know, trying to build that with them. I definitely think that's one of the most important things. I think, you know, figuring out why, even like it's cool kind of assembling a startup team pretty early and then figuring out, okay, like what motivates people, what drives people. One thing that, that I had to I had to learn about is that people are wired differently. So people think differently. People are motivated by different things. You can't, as a startup CEO or as, as the workhorse person, be like, yo, this is, you know, what like my company needs to be so much like me. You know, it needs to be, um, very well rounded, very diverse in thought and and ethic and and everything like that. So I definitely think team is team is very important. I think team is it's interesting kind of working with team. Tell me this: you used to play basketball. How do you go about kind of using that into you know your everything that you're doing now when it comes down to running a company? I always talk about how basketball <laughs> and and this is like very similar. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is just being passionate about it. Like, I was very passionate about basketball. That's like what got me up in the morning, you know, every day. And I wanted to work out and I wanted to get better. Um, and I think that's kind of the same philosophy that I bring to, to Darren is, you know, it's just something I'm passionate about, it's something I want to do every day. Like, I got to get my reps in. Like, I got to, you know, do what needs to get done to, you know, advance. Um, and so I think, you know, that's kind of the main thing that I feel like I've carried over is just, you know, just working really hard. Um, and, you know, being really passionate about the product, um, I think kind of, it doesn't really feel like work. Sometimes it really feels like work, but, you know, when you're, uh, you're having fun with it, you know, going to the office every day and you're with like, you know, your friends that are your coworkers, it, it makes it feel, you know, a lot better, uh, rather than, you know, being forced to, you know, be here and not wanting to be there. And then, you know, you're not putting all the passion you want into your project. So, uh, I think the main thing is just, you know, having passion about it, um, and just also putting in the work and, and the reps. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I definitely think like that's that's everything because it it you gotta you gotta stay up on those dark days. You know, it's such a long process. Like just uh, from idea to to all these different stages. I even talk about all the time how you launch multiple multiple different times. Tell me this: What do you think a mi the a misconception about a startup is? Like, what do you think is like the biggest misconception about startup life for startup founders? Oh, misconception. Um, I'd say the biggest misconception is that, like, there's, like, the amount of work that's going on behind the scenes. I feel like there's not, like, once you, uh, like, get behind kind of the scenes of a startup, you realize, like, how much work, like, actually goes into it. Um, kind of from the outside, you, it might not seem like much, but, you know, there's everything from, like, the legal aspect to, you know, talking to lawyers to talking to, you know, trying to raise, there's the marketing, there's the coding, there's the design. Um, so I don't really think, you know, for founders, you know, who've gone kind of through like all the nitty gritty, like people definitely, you know, experience, you know, you're kind of doing a thousand things at once. But I think, you know, it's kind of, that's the biggest misconception is that, you know, there's probably, you know, very little people uh, doing a lot of work. Um, but that's, you know, kind of what comes with a, with a startup. But I think it's a huge misconception is, you know, the amount of work that's getting done behind the scenes. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And I think one of the, one of the, heftier jobs of that both of us have is raising and i think like raising money as a startup founder you got to keep the bills paying and so um you know even me like when i first started my idea i thought i would need investors even a little bit earlier than i did and you know i luckily i even turned down a deal that you know probably a lot more money but took up a lot more equity at the time and looking back at it, i'm like oh thank god you know i wouldn't have taken something like that Kind of talk to me a little bit about fundraising, uh, what your what your mindset is about that, and how you how you go about that. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, it's the first time you know I'm you know fundraising, right? First time founder, um, so I'm definitely learning a lot, kind of as I go. But I'd say you know the main takeaway that I've 
learned is don't cold email people. It never works. <laughs> um, but, you know, try to, you know, uh, meet other founders, uh, meet with, you know, other people who are knowledgeable, you know, in the space uh, and just trying to get as many lukewarm welcomes to people that are in, you know, uh, VCs or, you know, at angel, you know, or at incubators, accelerators, um, wherever, but it's kind of a constant grind of, you know, selling the idea to these people that you've never kind of met before. Um, but when you meet those people, you know, taking those and trying to, you know, pitch your product and get, you know, in front of the right people uh, as well. Yeah, no, that's for sure. I, you, you mentioned accelerators. Are you, have you been in any accelerators or like how, how is that, yeah. how is that going? Yeah. So we were in the uh, NYU startup sprint. Uh, it was like two weeks uh, this summer. Uh, but it was really good. Uh, we learned learned definitely a lot as a team, uh, you know, going in there and, you know, kind of finding product market fit is, you know, a huge thing that a company needs to find and find like an effective tunnel that, you know, that works within that you can push out the product and find the right people that are going to, you know, utilize and use your idea or product. Um, so I think, you know, that's where we really, you know, leverage the you know, knowledge from the accelerator and, you know, finding those places where we can put our, de- uh, put our you know, company in front of where, it's going to create an activation point for, you know, someone to actually go and onto our platform and use it. That's why. That's why. That's definitely true. I definitely think product market fit is important. I also think what's very important is consistently kind of tweaking your product so that it gears towards that. Um, I even talked about kind of my mistakes as a product builder. And it's like, especially with us, like you want to kind of get your vision out and you want to like, you know, execute on certain things. Uh, I remember even on our call earlier, I was like, one mistake I made was building a half-assed product instead of a half product. And so, you know, definitely, I think even when I asked you, like, what the biggest misconception about, like, a startup founder or CEO is, I think, like, a lot of people don't understand that, like, what we do is kind of drive the product. And so, like, what the user is actually interacting with, whether that's your marketplace, whether that's your piece of, code, like, whatever that is, um, that whatever that piece of technology is, that's kind of what, you know, we, we are doing, we're driving that product. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for, for being on. Tell me this, is there anything that, one thing that we always talk about on the show is kind of our right hand has taken us to a place where, you know, we could, we could score at times and then, you know, sometimes your right gets shut down and, you know, you have to work on your left in order to, to really get, you know, um, better at, at, at your game and at your craft. Is there anything that you want to improve on? Is there anything that you're learning about right now um, that could really get you to that next level? Yeah, I think it's it's like it's kind of with everything. It's like constantly evolving. Uh, but there's definitely like on the coding aspect, like an, I can always get better. And the better I get, you know, the faster we can kind of build features. So there's definitely that aspect of things. Uh, and then I also think on kind of the raising, you know, just understanding, you know, term sheets, you know, getting in front of the right people, being able to pitch it. Um, so I definitely feel like, you know, that's something I'm you know, improving upon, you know, all the time. Uh, but I'd, I'd say definitely, you know, those two things, coding and kind of, you know, figuring out, you know, how to raise uh, in an effective manner and getting in front of the right people. 100%, 100%. Someone just asked, how do you stay motivated? <laughs> uh, obviously, this is a big thing in, in, in Star Road, and it's it's hard at times. So like, kind of, how do, how do you stay motivated? How do you keep yourself going? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I try to keep myself, you know, motivated as, as you know, possible. And definitely ha- you have your days where you're down. You definitely have your days where you're up. Like, it's not always like you wake up and you're like, okay, we're going to you know, build this, you know, right away. But I think setting, like, attainable goals like, that are kind of more short term, you know, saying, hey, like, we want to add, you know, TikTok by the you know end of the month or we want to add, you know, YouTube by the end of the month, you know, kind of having those goals. And then, you know, I feel like it's, like, very satisfying, you know, kind of writing at your goals and then finally getting to the place where you accomplish them. Um, but I think, you know, it's something that, you know, everyone should do. Um, I got to have these notebooks that I kind of write everything like out and it's pretty cool to like go back to them and be like, wow, like I was writing about this and I had no idea what this was um, at the time. And then it's like, oh, wow, like we converted from like an LLC to a C Corp. I don't even know how to do that. Uh, and then you, know, you look back in your notebook and you're like, oh, like, wow, like we're, we're now C Corp, right? There's like things like that where it's like, you can kind of go back and be like, I had these little goals. I didn't even know how to accomplish them at the time. Uh, but then, you know, it creates those little motivate, like those little, you know, uh, motivation spikes, I would say, to say, hey, you know, I want to get this done um, and kind of, you know, kind of check off the list as you go. A hundred percent. I'm I'm sorry. I just wanted to tap in on one thing you said. A lot of people um, always ask me about LLCs. 
and they go like you know like I, I I always think like I'm always getting told that I need to start my LLC I tell them Fitz is a C-Corp do you want to just kind of talk about that first like just to, to shed light on it for other people yeah yeah I mean the reason you want to start an LLC is like for tax uh, purposes right so like if you are a company and you want to have tax write-off do an LLC uh, if you want your company to get invested in uh, make it a C-Corp no VC fund is going to invest in you if you're an LLC just because of tax reasons because uh, you'll get double tax if you're an LLC. Um, so I definitely think, you know, if you're re- in the very early beginning stages, have it as an LLC, you can write it off, you know, on your taxes. But when you, once you kind of get to a, you know, C Corp and you're kind of ready to accept investments, that's when you should kind of convert over. 100%. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so yeah. much for, for being on the show. I really appreciate you, man. And and really good luck with good luck with everything. I'm super excited to see everything you've got. Is there anything else you wanted to mention or talk about? I think, yeah, I think I'm good. But uh, thanks for having me on. Um, and I'm looking forward to you know, seeing how this podcast grows and, uh, and also just seeing how, you know, your journey goes as well. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you, man. Really appreciate you. Thanks for the game. And uh, I'm going to catch you soon. Okay, cool. See ya. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Yep, see ya. That was some good game. That's some good game. Like the, the, the life of a startup founder is, is definitely really interesting. One thing that I want to do is meet a lot more founders. I think that, you know, we all have a lot to learn from each other. And so, you know, we're really in a in an area where we have abilities to, you know, do what we want and, and help each other out. And I think, you know, there's just something that that's so cool about that. So love everything he's doing. And, you know, I want to keep seeing, keep seeing the growth. Um, yeah, so that is the episode for today. Today we had on Noah Fennel. Uh, the, the CEO of Data Earn. We had on Terrell, the creator and director of Webster Hall TV. So I'm just super excited to see um, everything both of them come out with. Um, other than that, you know, I guess we'll kind of talk, I want to talk a little bit about content real quick, because that's something that I've been thinking about a lot today. Um, I tapped into like some old John Henry content videos. And it kind of got me kind of going again about how I want to use content. And I think the real thing about content is content gives you an ability to build brand. And there is a big difference between over-indexing on sales and over-indexing on brand, right? And so a lot of times, and even Fitz is guilty of this, when we first launched, we were pretty quickly trying to sell and like we kind of over indexed in the beginning on sales. We even waited to launch until we were ready to sell. And one thing that I'm learning, and I think that this is what I've been trying to do with my own personal brand and stuff like that is focus more on brand than sales. Whereas sales starts here on the graph and it goes down Brand is something that you consistently build for a long time and the exponential graph goes up. And so what what is that like? I, I was talking to Rob the other day and I said a lot of fashion designers on their on their Instagram feed, it's just all stuff that they're selling and they don't really have any backbone or any brand connected to that. And so brand is what is the feeling that people get about you when you're not in the room? Like what what would someone say about you when you're not in the room and like, one thing that I've been trying to do is build my personal brand. And so I was already a CEO and I was already doing everything that I'm doing now. But then once you add content to that fold, you give yourself the ability to tell your story. And when you make your own content, you're the editor and you're the one putting out that message. And so what I learned is that, you know, it's, it's so different even like when I go out, going out and people saying, hey, I you know, I'd be seeing you all the time on my, on my for you page. I see you all the time. Like I am now getting called or being, um, I'm being connected to the word CEO. And that's like exactly what I set out to do the whole time, make content and, and kind of tell this brand story and push out my message while kind of making my own personal brand very connected with that of being a CEO. And so content is something that it's very interesting. It's very hard. Uh, in the beginning, it, you kind of go through a whirlwind of emotions. You start hearing yourself talk. You're like, man, I remember for the longest, I was like, man, am I even valid enough to be making content about stuff like this? But what I realized is like, don't talk on anything that you don't know about. 
um, document instead of create. And so the best way of doing this, and this is kind of what I've been focused on today, is creating hub content. Hub content is episodic content, right? Game of Power is a piece of hub content. So there's Game of Power Episode 1, Game of Power Episode 2, right? Episode 7, 10. And so it's just going to keep going up from there. And so when you have something like Game of Power, that's your that's your piece of hub, then you can repeatedly put content behind that piece of hub. Another one of my things that I've been wanting to do is make vlogs, right? And so instead of being like putting out random vlogs and sound bites, I'm doing something called Startup Journey. Startup Journey Episode 1, which is coming out later tonight. And then Episode 2, 3, and so on. So if you start kind of figuring out how to make these pieces of hub content, you can get out content a lot faster. See, what a lot of people don't realize is like, if you had to go and make a, a, a reinvent the wheel and make a new video each time you wanted to spread a certain message, it would take you so long to do that. So what you do is you make a piece of hub content, say like Game of Power, right? And you take this long form content and you can chop it down into micro snackable pieces for people to easily consume. And so, you know, I'm going to start doing a few more series. I'm doing Startup Journey. Um, I'm doing, it's called uh, Weaker Power. So that's like a reaction to like news about entrepreneurship and stuff like that. Um, and I'm also going to do Creator Playbook. So I wanted it, I wanted to be Startup Playbook. And Startup Playbook was supposed to be like what it's like kind of like building and running a company from like incorporation to uh, like making a pitch deck to picking a business model and X, Y, and Z. But Creator Playbook is actually even a little more broad. I can kind of bring in the fashion uh, side of things. I can bring in kind of the creator economy side of things and tie everything together a little bit better. So yeah, I think my advice to anyone that wants to get into content, but isn't even necessarily that comfortable with taking that camera and putting it in front of your face, just start documenting, start recording some of your conversations, start, you know what I mean, just doing stuff like that so that you can take all of that long form and you can just start chopping it up and it's very natural. And so I'm not even at a place yet where I can sit in front of the camera and just go off um, on a bunch of different video ideas for a couple hours. Like I'm not necessarily there yet. So I think, you know, if you do want to get into content, um, you got to just do it by document. And so I think um, one thing that's very interesting is kind of the whole sales and marketing funnel in general and so people can discover you in about six different ways there's only really six different ways people can discover you paid ad right so you run facebook ads you run instagram ads tiktok ads youtube right you have organic social so organic social media is the reels it's the tiktoks it's youtube videos it's stuff that you're not paying for it's stuff that you're generating yourself um, that's like the biggest hitter right there for me. That's the thing we over-index on most organic social. You can have a podcast or a show. So if you have a company, say you um, have a sports drink company, right? You could have a podcast about what it's like, you know, what it's like being an athlete and, and interview different athletes and, and talk to that different consumer base. So podcasts are definitely something that's big. Earn Your Leisure is a big podcast that they kind of built their whole business around you know, people discovering them from their podcast. Um, the next thing is press. So we don't, like, I've never had any press uh, for fits, but press is, like, pretty big if you if you either, you know, pitch PR people or if you do something big, a lot of people raise money and get a lot of press. So I think that's a, that's a very interesting thing. Press is, like, when you're in TechCrunch, Forbes, et cetera. Um, next is influencers. So obviously influencers could be a, a person, like, influencers could be a way of people discovering you. So we even see TikTok creators kind of creating four brands and then people are driving, you know, their audiences and they're driving that traffic back to your company. So that's the that's the fifth way. And then the last way is offline. So you can every you can really hustle everything offline, whether that's going and, and having events in the city, whether that is walking around and, and handing out cards. Um, those are just like the different ways that you can raise awareness for your company. And so what I realized is well, we don't have that much money to use in the pay dad. And when, when you turn off the payment, then that traffic's not coming anymore. And so 
from there, what are the different things we can do? And so what we really over-indexed on was hub, episodic, uh, organic content. And so that's what we've been focused on recently. So I hope that helps um, anyone that kind of starts a business. What I realized is like, I have something to sell. I, I have people that I need to help. I even need to generate leads to handle certain ser service agency businesses. And it makes everything a hell of a lot easier when you are consistently putting out content, telling your story and telling your brand message. So hope that helps. Um, yeah, this is episode six of Game of Power. Uh, thank you guys for, for, for joining me today. And I'll see y'all next week. Have a good one.